And with that, I think we can officially get started. We're at about 70 folks and growing in the room. Um, welcome to everybody again who is joining us for SOAR's inaugural summit entitled Together We Rise. Just a couple of quick notes before we fully dive in. If you have a copy of Deepa's book, who is our keynote speaker, please keep it at your desk. We uh, will be taking a photo later with it and with Deepa. If you are posting on social media today, you can use the hashtags Together We Rise 2023 or SOAR National Summit, National Summit 2023. Any variation of those are welcome. And you can also tag SOAR at South Asian SOAR. It's pretty easy, but we'll also send it in the chat. Um, so for those of you who joined the morning chai, you know that today, or sorry, this year marks 10 years from the last time we all gathered nationally. And the title of that conference was Arohan. Arohan meant to rise up. And if you can see, Aparna has her shirt from the first Arohan. Um, so it felt only fitting that so much of Soar's work, the title of this conference, all reference rising. This is a journey that we've been on collectively for 40 years. And today, this year is a moment of renewal and recommitment to that movement. Um, for some of you, this is your first time in a SOAR space. This is our first summit. We want to say welcome. We are honored that you are spending if some portion or your whole day with us. For those of you have, who have been here, thank you for supporting us. And we couldn't have done this summit um, or even fathomed it without you. So for a quick intro to SOAR, SOAR stands for Survivors, Organizations, Allies, and Rising. We'll share a little bit more about SOAR throughout the presentation or throughout the, the session this morning. Um, but quickly, we wanted to introduce you to SOAR's team. So my name is Amrita. I am, my pronouns are she, her, and I am the executive director of SOAR. Again, very, very honored and grateful to be holding this space today. And I'll pass it to my colleague, Nashi. Hi, my name is Nashi. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the policy and systems change manager at SOAR. Very grateful to be sharing space with you all. And I'll pass it to Hamadri. Thank you. Um, I'm Hamadri, pronouns she, they. I'm the program and membership manager at SOAR. Um, and I'm so excited to be here with you all today. Beautiful. And now a little bit more about our work and, and what we do. And this is really just to ground us in why we're here today. So SOAR was founded officially in 2020, um, uh, or sorry, conceived in 2020, founded officially in 2021, almost at the peak of the pandemic, to break down silos and unify a national movement. As many of you know, you are one or you belong to one organization of several, I think, but somewhere between 40 and 45 is our running count of organizations that serve South Asian survivors of gender-based violence. And it was around September 2020 when several leaders from your organizations, including Manavi, Daya, Saki, came together and Raksha and came together and said, we need to be working together in coalition because we can't do this alone. We were all facing unprecedented crises during COVID and needed to find a way forward together. And from that need, SOAR blossomed. And SOAR's mission is to grow both survivor and collective power to transform the culture and systems that lead to violence. We'll get into more of what that means throughout the day. Um, but most importantly, two things we wanted to share is currently we convene a collective of 32 organizations across 13 states, which includes so many of you. And secondly, recently we published a report called Together We Rise. Now you can put two and two together. Uh, that is also the name of our summit. And our report really laid the groundwork for what we hope to build today. The report laid out the challenges that our field faces. And today we hope to make a commitment of how we move forward. So before we get into our agenda, I wanted to ground us further into why we're here today. At the end of 2022, 
we all came together for a series called Their Light Remains. And Their Light Remains was a moment to acknowledge, honor, and remember the lives that we had lost to GBV in 2022. We know that that, that was just an acknowledgement of the lives lost, but there are so many folks that you've served and maybe even lost over decades long um, movement and before it started. And so today we wanna to dedicate our summit to, them, to those who we have lost to violence, to those who are healing from violence, and to all of us, those who dream boldly of a future free of violence. I ground us in this so that we can come back to this at any point in the summit, should there be disagreements, should there be confusion about how we move forward, we know that this is what we're all grounded in. And this is one of our deeply held core beliefs that we share. To that end, I wanna give us a little bit of a lay of the land of who's in the room with us today. At some point today, we will have folks, over 125 individuals across 32 organizations, across 12 states. And when we asked in our registration form about who identifies as a survivor, 50 or more of you, because registrations are still coming in as of this morning, noted that you've experienced gender-based violence or power-based violence. And I just wanna let that sink in with the dedication because in the metaphorical space that you're in, the person to your right, your left, in front of you, behind you, may identify as a survivor. You yourself may identify as a survivor. I know that that's an identity I bring into this space today. And so be thoughtful about your words, be thoughtful about your intentions. And also, if you do identify as a survivor, and even if you've supported one or are an ally to one or many, just take the time that you need today. Um, this isn't easy, it's, it's heart work, it's life's work. So take the space and time that you need to take care of yourself. All right. And with that, a little bit more grounding into where we're going. So today, um, we know that many of your day-to-days look like serving clients, responding to crises. Today, we're gonna ask you to take a little bit of a step back and zoom out from there. Today, we invite you to reimagine with us um, and our team has been really gravitating towards this quote from writer and organizer, Gloria Anzaldúa. Nothing happens in the real world unless it first happens in the images in our heads. So today, as you envision, as you imagine, as you dream, think about the vision of, of future free of violence that you see in your head and let that drive you. Liberate yourself of the constraints that you currently experience and dream big. And we can figure out how to get there. And that's what we'll do today, or we'll start doing today. I don't wanna oversell ourselves. <laughs> and with that, let's dive into our agenda. So we are currently in the welcome session. Um, right after this, we will, or right after, um, I wrap up, we will invite Deepa Iyer for our keynote, and then we'll close this session with some housekeeping. We'll then dive into a presentation, which is data on the state of gender-based violence. We are super thrilled to share some data that SOAR collected last year that we have not published yet, um, and we'll be sharing today. We'll then go into a 15-minute break, making sure you get all the time you need to take care of food, bio breaks, movement, hydration, all the things you need. And then we'll go into our first of a series of workshops, which is driving change at every le level led by Nashi on our team. It's going to be an informative and interactive workshop that is focused on systems change, really keeping in mind that idea of reimagining. Right after that, we will go into another 15 minute break followed by a networking lunch, which is optional, but we highly recommend it. You will be, this is an opportunity for you to meet folks in your role. Um, which so many of you have requested. And then our final workshop for the day, mobilizing and engaging our communities, really taking our big visions and thinking about how do we engage our communities in that conversation. That will be led by me and along with guest presenter Avantika Shinoy from DVRP. 
And then before our closing, we have one last 15 minute break. Um, and then we will dive into our closing with remarks from both Aparna Vadacharya and Halima Barucha, who will be joining us later today. And then finally, to end the day and chill out and unwind, you are welcome to debrief at a virtual happy hour with the SOAR team. Um, no pressure, it's completely optional, but we're here to hang out and we, we want to hear your thoughts and reflections at the end of the day. Um, as you know, this is our inaugural summit. So I also just want to say um, our entire team is here to support you, but we would also love grace and uh, patience as we figure things out. If we encounter difficulties, it's our first time doing a lot of these things. Um, so we would love and deeply appreciate that. And we are so, so excited to hold this space for you. And lastly, just wanted to ground us in some final intentions and objectives. This is really what came from you. So our objectives and intentions today are to connect and to learn um, and to begin to strategize. I won't read these out because I've already kind of spoken to them, but they are in the slides and they are in the handbook. So you can feel free to look at them there. And with that, I am so excited to pass it on quickly to Nashi to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you. It is my pleasure to be introducing Deepa Iyer as our keynote speaker for today. Deepa is a writer, a strategist, and a lawyer, and so many other things whose advocacy work is rooted in the experiences of Asian American, South Asian, Muslim, Arab communities. Currently, Deepa leads uh, projects on solidarity and social movements at the Building Movement Project. Deepa's impact echoes across our movement. Um, the narratives uplifted through her solidarity is this podcast and the bridges she has forged across generations and diasporas reflect so many of our shared dreams to drive transformative change through community power. And her book, Social Change Now, a guide for reflection and connection, which some of you received through our summit raffle, not only affirms that this dream of ours is possible, but offers a meaningful pathway to achieving it. So we look to her today to offer some words of inspiration as we start to map out what that pathway to change for us looks like. And there's so much more to say about Deepa. And so we shared her bio in the Summit Handbook. And for those of you who are, for those of you who are interested in learning more about her journey as a community-driven change maker. And with that, I'll hand it to Deepa. Thank you. Oh my goodness. It is so great to see the names and faces um, in this Zoom. I was saying earlier, I think I tweeted it out that it really feels like coming home. Um, thank you so much, Amrita, for uh, you and your team for creating this space. Um, really appreciate it. And I am so excited to be here with all of you. Um, I wanted to also just let you know that two of my colleagues are also in this space with me. Um, Wing T. Tran Myra, who's actually going to help move through the slide deck, um, as well as um, Adaku Uta. Um, they're both with Building Movement Project and Solidarity is. So they're also here in the space um, as well. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm so grateful and humbled to be invited into the space. Um, before we kind of pull up the solid uh, the deck, actually, I'm going to put an, a, a question into the chat. You can respond anytime you want. Um, and here's the chat question, which is, um, what is the boldest headline you'd like to see in 2023 when it comes to gender justice? Okay, I'll put it into the chat. So just think very bold, think very big, and you can um, put it into the chat. It can be like a couple of words, a phrase, whatever is coming up for you, but look to your North Star. All right. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to ask Wing T to go ahead and start the slide deck, if that's okay. So give us a second to do that. Thank you, Wing T. All right, so I just wanted to start off again um, just by saying how grateful and humbled I am to be in this space um, because this is really the space and the people that I learned from when I began my work in the South Asian community over two decades ago. Um, and my own personal points of entry as an immigrant to the US, um, navigating racial dynamics in the South, 
and my work in post 9-11 America have all been shaped and sustained by community connections. And so many of those community connections are really coming from this space of um, organizations and individual leaders who have taught me so much about how to lead with grace and humility and discernment. Um, and I think as some of you might know, uh, I helped to start SALT, South Asian Americans Leading Together, a national nonprofit, and was the ED between 2004 and 2014. And SALT could not have existed without the landscape of South Asian women's organizations that were already anchoring our communities. And that beautiful timeline on SOAR's um, website shows us the richness of this history and the knowledge of community that each of you holds. So gratitude, gratitude, gratitude is where I wanna begin. Um, and then going to the next slide, um, I actually dug deep into SALT's Facebook archives to find some of these pictures. And you might see some familiar faces in these pictures. Um, during our first year at SALT in 2004, we actually did a series of events called SALT Exchanges. And these were dialogues in different parts of the country. And each of these dialogues was anchored by a South Asian women's organization whether that was Saki in New York City or Apnagar in Chicago, Manavi in New Jersey, Raksha in Atlanta, Narka in the Bay Area, Daya in Houston. Um, these organizations were the anchors in our communities. And a few years later, when at SALT, we formed the National Council of South Asian Organizations. It was people like Aparna Bhattacharya, Purvi Shah, Manisha Kelkar, Navneet Bala then with us and now at Manavi, and others who provided so much guidance and vision for how we could grow our network. So all this is for me to say that um, the South Asian um, leaders in this space really are the pioneers and have created this beautiful and robust ecosystem of social change. Um, and I think one of the things that SOAR has done so well is to weave these already existing connections and uh, made sure that they're within the ecosystem more visibly and clearly. I see a lot of great headlines in the chat. I'm gonna come back to those in a little bit, but please keep um, putting them in. And if you just joined us, the checking question is, what is the boldest news headline you'd like to see in 2023 as it, um, as it reflects on gender justice? Okay. So I use the word ecosystem, and that is a word that I'm gonna be talking about a lot throughout this um, conversation. So I wanted to provide a little bit of um, some characteristics that we often think about when we think of an ecosystem. And I want you to reflect as you're hearing this on the ecosystems that you're part of and that you're connected to through SOAR. So an ecosystem is really a space, a community, right? Um, it's, it's where we feel a sense of belonging. And we feel that our values and our goals are aligned with the other people and organizations in our ecosystem. And when ecosystems are really strong, um, we often find that they emphasize the importance of cultivating relationships, of nurturing those relationships, of sustaining those relationships. Um, and those are some of the characteristics that we often find in ecosystems in nature, our body, and of course, social change. And I think that you all have created such an ecosystem um, within the South Asian gender-based, uh, gender justice movement that is so important to lift up. And I wanted to do that through a framework that we've been using a lot at the Building Movement Project that I developed a number of years ago so called the Social Change Ecosystem Map, which you see on the screen here. So in a minute, I'll be asking you to kind of map yourselves out. So um, we'll get to get to some interaction. I know it's a keynote, but you know you, you don't want to hear from me for forty minutes straight. So we'll make sure that there's a little bit of back and forth. Um, but this is a this is a framework that looks really simple. But if you work with it, I think that oftentimes you can have some profound insights and observations that show up. So there are three components to this framework. Um, one is the middle circle, which really reflects our shared values. And the, these are values that are important for your ecosystem that you would wanna highlight and emphasize. 
The second part of this framework is that it invites us to think about playing um, roles, showing up in roles rather than job titles when we engage in social change. Um, and then finally, this entire framework is based on the understanding that we are an ecosystem, that we work better when we're connected rather than when we're in silos or just in our lanes. So how do we build the critical connections between each other? And on the next slide, um, a couple of quick characteristics of this framework that you might find to be interesting. Um, this is a multi-dimensional framework. And what that means is you can use it as an individual, you can use it as an organization, or you can use it even as a network. For example, um, like SOAR could use this, for example, to map out the organizations within the network. So it gives us a sense of what our assets are in terms of um, our networks as well. But it also allows us to think about what our core assets and skills and strengths are, what we're really good at, what we want to um, flex, right, as individuals or organizations. And this framework keeps us accountable around our privilege, our positionality, and our power. So if we hold certain privileges and we're seen as showing up, say, as visionaries or uh, disruptors, which are kind of the more visible uh, roles in this framework over and over again, we might want to think about how we want to create some space for other organizations or other people to also share those roles. And finally, this framework can help us think about sustainability and well-being. So what does it mean to play all the roles, right? Um, what does it mean that um, we get burnt out when we're consistently playing roles that we're not necessarily either good at or that we don't get necessarily the help and support we need from others? So all of these questions, um, you could kind of work through using this particular framework. I want to move into really quickly showing you or telling you a little bit about the characteristics of these roles, and then we're going to put up a poll for you to um, take a look and see where you um, find yourselves as an organization. So really quickly, um, weavers are the organizations or people that connect the dots. Um, so SOAR is a weaver um, in the sense that SOAR is a network facilitator and saw the connections between all of the groups that are part of the network. Experimenters are those of us who take risks and course correct, right? So we're trying to think of different ways to engage. I often think about how in, um, honestly, like in the early days, a lot of the South Asian women's organizations were the ones who were able to get into temples and mosques and gurdwaras, right? Um, and they did so using um, workshops like, let's talk about family. And those were ways, experiments, but those were ways to actually talk about gender-based justice or intimate partner violence in the context of places of worship in our communities. Frontline responders. I'm pretty sure that every single one of you would consider yourself to be a frontline responder because frontline responders are the ones who are responding to a community crisis, whether it's an individual or an entire community, and they know what to do. They know um, what shelters to send people to, who are the partners that need to assist around getting jobs for someone um, who is fleeing a situation, right? You know how to respond in that vein. So all of you are frontline responders likely. Um, and I also wanna encourage you and invite you to think about what else you can be in terms of either weavers or visionaries or storytellers, because you're likely playing those roles as well. Now, visionaries, you're all visionaries, because when I look at the chat here, I'm seeing that um, there are amazing visions that are being put into um, the, 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 the chat here, right? Hoping for a future where e equality is not something we have to fight for, but rather the way the world treats everyone, says Prabha. Um, trying to, GBV survivors no longer carry the burden of ending abuse, says Shailaja. Um, we've created safer worlds without prisons, police, and borders. We have sovereignty over our bodies and love in liberatory ways. I don't know who said that, but that person got a lot of avantika, I think. Um, and abortion legalized. Yes. Um, gender justice is a birthright. All of us run out of business. Yes, Mona. Trans leaders overcome anti-trans bills across Southern states. 
Thank you, Mars. These are amazing visions, right? They're visions for the future. They're visions for the present. Um, and visionaries are those of us who can really um, tell us about the North Star. This is where we're going. Um, and they can inspire us and remind us when we feel lost and overwhelmed. Now, visionaries, and you probably already noticed this about the, the map, um, need builders to actually make the vision a reality. And so builders are those of us who are creating the scaffolding between our reality and that North Star. So the ones who are putting together the programs, the events, um, the conferences, the ones who are figuring out the outreach methods um, that need to happen in a particular community, right? Those are the builders. On to the next slide. So caregivers and healers connected and also a little different. Um, caregivers are those who are really thinking about the people in their community um, that they know well. And so they nourish um, those folks by creating and sustaining a community of care. And if you happen to read my book, Social Change Now, you'll find a very familiar person um, whom I have identified as a caregiver in my life and honestly, the lives of many. And that's, of course, Aparna Bhattacharya, um, who I think has the ability to understand what it is that people need, maybe see it before they, they themselves see it, and then doing the check-in before, during, and after, right? And coming back time and again um, to make sure that people feel like they're connected and seen. That's what caregivers do. Healers um, are those of us who actually are looking at a bit of a higher level and they're seeing how generational and current traumas wind themselves through ourselves, our bodies, our communities, um, and are the result of oppressive systems. So many of you use healing justice in the work that you do. You have to, right, as you're dealing with trauma. Disruptors. Um, disruptors are um, what Representative John Lewis told us to do to get into good trouble. And that's what disruptors do. Oftentimes, they can be visible. Um, and others feel a little bit uncomfortable when disruptors are in the space. But disruptors are trying to build power and connect again to the big vision. Storytellers are those of us who are sharing our community stories, especially when they're oftentimes rendered invisible or even banned. And we're doing that in various ways. And finally, guides. Um, guides are those of us orgs or people who have played another role on the map um, quite well and for some time. And they're able to kind of mentor others who are filling those roles now. And so, um, I can already see here in the in the chat that some of you are identifying um, the folks in the space as well as organizations that play some of these roles. And as I mentioned, um, you know, I really do feel that SOAR members are playing so many of these roles, right? Um, I mentioned earlier the experimental role. I think that you all are also gentle disruptors because you have identified and forced conversations that we need to be having in our communities um, that we don't necessarily want to have. Um, I think that many of uh, Savos are weavers, um, bringing together organizations with shared values to lift up lessons. Um, one look at the Adohan agenda from 2013 reveals that the conversations that were happening then took a big picture view, right? Um, and finally, many of you are healers. Um, and you you uplift the importance of um, listening circles, um, talk therapy, somatic practice, and make sure to remind us that all of this has to be done in a culturally and linguistically appropriate and trauma-informed manner. You bring this approach not just to your ecosystem, but to so many other ecosystems as well that need to hear this. So I think this is a good time for us um, to uh, reflect on the ecosystem framework for a couple of minutes. And we're going to have you actually complete a poll that Wing T is going to put into the chat. You'll have to go somewhere else to take this poll, but you can click on, click on that link and you can take the poll. Um, and the question is, um, what role is um, your organization playing um, in the ecosystem framework? Um, so if you, you could probably see, don't worry about the title there. We'll call it, uh, don't worry about the impact leader. Just think about your organization for now. Um, and there are a number of, the 10 roles are underneath and their descriptions are there as well, if you can take a look. So I'll give you a minute to do that. And I know it's hard to pick just one. So pick the primary one that comes to you um, today.
So again, what role does your organization play? And if you can't use the, the mentee, whatever it's called, the poll, um, you can also put it into the chat. It's totally fine. We'll give it one more minute. Okay, Wing T, do you think that we're we're done? And I we should look at the results, or should we wait a little longer? I think maybe five more seconds from when I finish speaking now. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I can see in the chat, um, hi, Amintha, um, saying so hard to choose, right? Yes, it is hard to choose. And I think that what I often say is um, a couple of things, which is that obviously we play so many of these roles as people and organizations, but it is important to identify sort of the three primary and dominant ways in which we show up. Because if we play all the roles, then we might want to think about sustainability, right? We might want to think about redundancy. We might want to think about um, what it is that um, is happening in the ecosystem generally. We might want to think about the needs in the moment. So one context might require us to actually be a disruptor, whereas another context might require us to be a healer. So it depends on the type of situation. It depends, oh, as Aparna has said in the chat, it depends on the context and it depends on who else is playing other roles as well, right? Um, so a lot of redundancies can be kind of taken away if we map our ecosystems out. And Preeti makes, or Preet, I'm so sorry, makes a good point that um, it also depends on the role you play in your org. Absolutely, because our organizations are the people in them, right? Um, so sometimes there's a good question to think about, which is if our organization wants to say be a visionary, but no one on our staff feels like they're a visionary, what do we need to do to support people to step into that role, right? So those are also questions um, that you could uh, think about the, think about while you do this. Avantika, I do see things overlapping too. Absolutely. I think mean, that's such an excellent point. Um, so sometimes when we are storytellers, we're actually being disruptors, right? Because we're changing a message or we're shifting a narrative. So in many ways, you could be combining strategy and approaches as you play roles as well. So it's an excellent point. Thank you. All right. I'm going to um, I'm going to stop here and take a look. And it looks like in this particular ecosystem here, um, we have got groups playing the role of the frontline responder primarily, um, which is really tough work. And I will say that for frontline responders, if you're a person or an org, it's really important to have caregivers and visionaries in your ecosystem. Why is that? Because frontline response is one of the toughest roles to play. It requires you to constantly be attending to a crisis, right? And to build up a muscle of crisis. And over time, that can wear us down. And that's why it's so important to have caregivers in our ecosystems. It's important to have healers in our ecosystems and visionaries, because frontline responders really need to remember why they're doing the rapid response. Um, because if it they're not connecting it to a bigger vision, if they're not seeing a systems change, if they're not seeing a policy shift, that kind of frontline response can become extremely challenging. Um, so keep that in mind as well. Um, and then that's followed by, it looks like builders. Yes, every nonprofit space is full of builders. We have to be, right, in order to create the institutions that are necessary. Um, healers following that and weavers. Um, so that's, this is great. This is like a really nice spread because oftentimes when we do this as Wing T and Adaku know, we don't get a lot of folks um, or organizations saying that they are caregivers or healers. Um, but it's really important to have, as Amrita says in the chat, the care infrastructure. Um, and it looks like you all are already providing some of that through SOAR, which is excellent. Okay, so let's pause and come back to our slide deck. Um, I wanted to leave you with some thoughts on how you can use this right now that we've explained that, that we presented this to you. So you could use this framework 
like I said, as an individual or an organization or a network. But in this, in this particular slide, I'm going to focus in on institutions and coalitions. So you could use this to assess the ecosystem's characteristics. Are we interdependent? Are we being um, reciprocal? Are we preserving? Are we building care, right? Um, you could really map it out to see where the gaps are as well. And then if there are gaps, it's an opportunity to identify new partnerships. So if we don't have enough experimenters in our ecosystem, are there organizations that we can kind of bring into our ecosystem to play that role? And then um, redundancies, that's a really important one, that if we continually play the same role all the time, and, that's, and we have a plethora of orgs that are only playing one role, it is a redundancy issue. Um, so that is that about the framework. Um, I think that where you can find it has been offered into the chat if you want more on it. And on the next slide, um, just wanted to close this part out before I move into another piece that Amrita wanted me to discuss. Um, just these quotes from you know three amazing transformative women of color that really speaks to some of the outcomes that could come about if you use this framework. Um, I'll just pick out two. Um, uh, Nikki Giovanni, who said, if you don't understand yourself, you don't understand anybody else. So the importance of um, cultivating a practice of self-awareness in the work that we do. And Bell Hooks, one of the most vital ways we sustain ourselves is by building communities of resistance, places where we know we're not alone. And I think that's a good segue into thinking about what ecosystems can be when they are connected to communities of resistance and when they are connected to movements and social movements. So earlier on, I said that when we are frontline responders, that it's tough to play that role if we don't see some sort of systems change, right? And that's really what movement building is about. Um, and I think all of your organizations are part of a movement, part of different movements, movements on immigrant rights, um, movements on obviously reproductive rights, movements around ending gender-based violence, movements in the South Asian community, the Asian American community. Thankfully, we have a lot of movements in our communities that we can look to. And there are some characteristics of movement building that are on this slide. There are there are many more, I just picked these six um, that I wanted to share and then going to ask you again to come up with a couple of examples of how your organization is actually um, integrating or experimenting with some of these um, characteristics. So in movement building, we often start off by recognizing community needs. You all recognize a range of community needs, right? And then after that, we know we document those needs, we do research around them, we do dialogues, we engage in mutual aid and, and service provision. So we get a real sense of what the community needs are. And then that helps us to figure out what are the root causes that lead to that kind of need, that lead to inequity and injustice. And once we identify those root causes and tie them to systems and institutions and policies and practices and narratives, we can then figure out how to um, address them. And oftentimes that happens with partner partnership, partnering with other organizations who have shared values and shared goals. Um, it can be formations like organizations, but it could be collectives or networks or non-C3 formations, right? Then we think about how we use those partnerships to engage in collective action so that we're lifting up the needs and the demands of power. Um, in, in, and that could include recruiting new people to join, creating a mass movement. And then finally, um, using varied strategies and approaches, right? So public awareness, documentation, policy advocacy, healing justice, solidarity, a lot of different approaches that together with collective action and those values aligned partnerships can really get us to um, the system change that we want. So those are some of the characteristics of movement building that I think all of you engage in um, every single day beyond your frontline responder role that are really important to lift up. And so um, I would love to hear in the chat if you if you have a response to this question, which is reflecting on one to two examples of your, how you're engaging in movement building in your organization. Wing T's put it into the chat. Thank you, Wing T. Um, so take a look at these examples and you might have others of characteristics of how your organization is engaging in movement building. So I'd give you a second there to think about that.
I saw one example this morning that landed in my inbox, I think from Saki in New York City, um, which said, which took a policy position around the involuntary hospitalization policy in the city. That's an example of pinpointing a systems change and taking um, and, and finding a way to approach it and address it. Um, Vimy says outreach, education, training, and workshops as different strategies and approaches. Thank you. Um, collective campaigns and advocacy from Amrita. Building strong partnerships with faith leaders, a great way of moving beyond our, you know, traditional ecosystems. Thank you, Mona. Um, Krithika, hi, Krithika, says DVRP recognizes community needs through listening sessions and direct your work and inform it. And then that has developed your, re uh, your responses to anti-Asian violence and economic justice. Aparna says calling out language access violations in systems and institutions. Exactly. So the reason I wanted to, to lean into this is I think sometimes there's this perception that folks who are doing frontline response or service provider work, grassroots uh, work are not doing movement work, but you are, you are absolutely doing it. And um, I think it's important that we don't silo all of our organizations in these ways, because you're absolutely doing every one of these things um, and, and helping the other ecosystems also change and grow. So we'll go into the next slide and I'll come back to the chat as well. Um, so on the next slide, this is just a quote from Angela Davis, which we use a lot and love on what I want the root causes. Um, and so uh, the quote is, if we wish to be radical in our quest for change, then we must get to the root of our oppression. Radical simply means grasping things at the root, right? And so um, whatever those roots are, white supremacy or sexism or patriarchy, naming those and grabbing them at the root is a critical way to do movement building work. Um, and then another slide, um, this, I love this picture. Um, I don't know if you recognize Siobhan. I don't know if Shivana is here. Shivana Jarawar from Jahaji Sisters. But this is a, this is an, this is an example of a mass movement, right? Um, this is how Shivana is at the front line of one of the reproductive rights marches that happened last year. And it shows again, um, how we can be and are part of mass movements, how we are taking collective action, and how we are um, also connecting with broader ecosystems for change as well in recognizing the intersectionalities. So in the chat, uh, Manisha, um, engaging with the DV Coalition to support legislative priorities that impact the survivors you work with. Absolutely. Uh, Meghna, using anti-oppressive, decolonized, decolonialized, anti-capitalist approaches to storytelling. Yes. Um, and Sick Family Center is identifying community needs and developing new programs and need for trauma-informed storytelling, and then looking at the landscape around you um, as well to um, uplift common themes. This is fantastic. So all of these are examples of that type of um, movement building that is happening in your organizations and across the network. So with that, um, I think we're going to come to the close of this. We talked about a framework for social change ecosystems. We talked about um, how movement building can happen in different ways and how you all are engaging in that. Um, we talked about how the framework um, on the social change map can be used by you in, in uh, your organization or in the network to enhance your work. And now we're going to take a collective breath because it's Pisces season. And so it's all about water. And that will lead me to the close. I think I have like a minute, so I hope I can do this. Um, I might need more than a minute or two, Amrita. Let me know if that's okay. Um, okay, so we are doing all of this work, right? All of this work at a time of multiple compounding crises in this country and around the world. And this slide is just a small snapshot of the ways in which the rights and livelihoods and bodies of um, our people are being attacked and restricted in this country. It is a lot, right? And all of us are facing these external dynamics that are happening in our communities and in states around the country. And at the same time, while you are tending to all of this and understanding how it relates and intersects with the work you do in the South Asian community, we're also dealing with a lot of internal challenges in our organizations and our movements. This is an image we often use called the movement pressure cooker. And basically what it denotes is that 
sometimes it feels like our organizations and our networks and our movement spaces are on a really hot stove and the burners are turned all the way up. And the burners could have different names on them depending on where what you're experiencing. But we often hear some of these trends from the groups we work with at the Building Movement Project, that folks are in unending cycles of crises, that there is a lack of resources, whether it's financial or people power, um, that there's trauma, direct or vicarious, that we're bringing into our spaces, and that there are a range of um, culture and practices that we all kind of do um, that end up making it challenging in our networks and our organizations. Um, so oftentimes it feels like we have to constantly produce because we're in this funding cycle or we have to constantly perform. Sometimes it feels like if we don't have everything right, um, that there, there, there is this kind of call for purity when it comes to ideology that makes it really difficult for us to move forward because we get stuck. So this pressure cooker environment, along with the external crises that we're tending to, can often, as the next slide shows, make us feel that we're playing this game of whack-a-mole, right? Um, one crisis down, another one comes up, or that we're not being effective. We keep doing the same things, we're not hitting the nail on the head, um, or that we feel like we're on this kind of seesaw of either outrage or numbness, um, or that we're exhausted and burned out and fatigued. And we find in our um, research reports that women of color leaders consistently tell us that this cycle that they are in right now, um, pandemic, uprisings, social injustice, um, is really taking a toll on them, right? And that is why frameworks like the ecosystem map could be useful. That is why another frame, framework I'll get to in a minute could be supportive in terms of lifting us all up as we're doing this really important and vital work. So where to next? Um, I don't ever have all the answers to any of this, but these are just a few ideas and suggestions. Um, so I'm just going to randomly pick some out. So one of the things I think is to set some BHAGs, which is a term used by Jim Collins, and what it stands for is big, hairy, audacious goals. Even while we are dealing with all of this stuff, the turmoil internally and externally, it can be helpful when we can set those BHAGs, right? Because they allow us to, um, as Arundhati Roy has said, see this time as a portal to something else. So use it as a portal and set the BHAGs. Another way to think about what we do next is to widen our ecosystems um, in the way that I showed you earlier, but to think about how we find in opportunities for intersectional work, um, whether it's for, with communities like, um, queer trans communities, Dalit and caste oppressed communities, Indo-Caribbean communities, as well as um, thinking about the intersections of class um, and uh, sexual orientation, right? How do we actually find new ecosystems that we can connect to beyond the ones that we are traditionally in? Another where to next um, is to think about um, whether our organizations are ready to pivot. How nimble are we um, so that we can respond to what is happening in our communities? And finally, discernment. This is kind of a new thing that I'm working on and thinking about, but um, I think this discernment that I'm talking about is sometimes in the internal organizational work that often happens or network work that happens, there can be so many challenges, right? Um, to get it always right all the time when it comes to inclusion and identity. Um, and, I, and I think that it's important for us to do some discernment when we're trying to work through that and to give ourselves some grace um, and humility as well. So how do we distinguish be between say hurt feelings and harm? is a question that I think about a lot. How do we try to deal with conflict in a generative way and recognizing that conflict is inevitable in our spaces? And then finally, where to next means an emphasis on well-being, um, our individual well-being and community care. And um, on this next slide, this is the last framework we wanna leave you with, um, the ecosystem of well-being. And so much of this is, um, relying on Wing T's work as well. Um, but we see sort of well-being in three ways, um, individual, organizational, and communities. 
and um, that it can't just be self-care, right? Um, but that is important. It is important to take responsibility for what we need as people, as human individuals, um, to be sustainable in this work. And we've listed some ideas um, on this framework for that. And then there's the organizational responsibility. How can our organizationals provide the material support that we need or build a culture of equity and inclusion um, while we give them grace, while we give our leaders the grace to do it, right? And the time to do it is super important. Um, and then communities of support. So even beyond our organizations and ourselves, we should also be looking to, you know, our friends, um, peer spaces, coaching, uh, mentors, guides, um, in order to provide us with the support and care that we need. So this is sort of a big picture sense of the different levels of well-being that we can cultivate as we do the what, where to next. So I hope that you've been able to take a few things from this um, conversation, um, whether it is the uh, social change map and roles, whether it's thinking about movement building characteristics, whether it's thinking about the where to next. Um, and if you want more of it, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, the Building Movement Project website is here. We do research on the nonprofit sector. We, um, we build and tend to relationships. Um, and Wing T, Adaku, and I specifically focus on a project on solidarity where we are playing the roles, and now you know what these mean, of builders, storytellers, and weavers. And with that, um, I think the next slide is just the info if you need to reach out to us or want to want a deeper dive into the social change map, for example, please feel free to reach out, contact us. Um, and with that, I'm sorry that I ran late and I'll turn it back over to you, Amrita. I like oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, <laughs> no worries, I was just gonna say, oh, now she actually will take over. Sounds good. Um, I just wanna say thank you so much, Deepa, for offering us such a deeply inspiring and resonant message. I'm struggling to find the words that um, do justice to what you just shared and offered us today, but um, I know your words will be kept close to us, not only today, but really beyond this summit. So we're so grateful to have shared space and time with you today. And um, I know we're running um, a little late, so I'm just gonna pass it to Hamadri now to help us commemorate this moment. Yes, thank you so much again, Deepa, and thank you everyone. Like Amrita mentioned earlier, we'd love to now take a quick group photo with everyone, including Deepa. Perfect. Um, so we're going to start off with our community guidelines, including our land acknowledgement. We can go to the next slide. Um, and this land acknowledgement values and agreements we really co-created with all of you. Um, you can find them in the resources section of the summit handbook, which we're going to review in a second, and we'll also put them in the chat. But if you have any thoughts or feedback on any of these, you can always let us know. Um, for time's sake, I'm not going to read the entire land acknowledgement, but it is something important for all of us to acknowledge as organizations that are dedicated to ending GBV, um, especially because we know that Indigenous folks experience some of the highest rates of GBV. Um, if you're unfamiliar with land acknowledgements or you don't know what land you're on, you can always start by visiting this website, nativeland.ca, um, and learn more about the land that you're on. And we'll move forward to community agreements and collective values. On the left is an excerpt from one of our values. You can find the full list in our community guidelines. Um, and on the right is our community agreements. Some things I just wanna quickly uplift. Um, we strive to remain present and engaged, meaning we encourage you to continue checking in with yourself about how best you can remain present, um, whether that means keeping your cameras on, commenting in the chat or taking breaks. Um, we uphold a culture of consent and respect personal boundaries, meaning please do not share um, any personal identifying information outside of this space. Um, we center lear learning, growth, and transformation. Um, please remember that everyone is at different points in their learning journey, um, and we strive to not only keep growing ourselves, but to also make space for others to continue growing. Um, we, we respect gender identity and expansiveness, um, so please make sure to check if someone has pronouns in their screen names, not to assume anyone's pronouns or gender identity, um, and just overall using inclusive language that recognizes that people of all genders can both experience and perpetuate harm. Um, and as always, this is, this is a survivor-centered and healing space. Um, so if those agreements sound good to everyone, feel free to put some thumbs up or some head nods. Um, and lastly, we'll move on to some quick housekeeping.
we can go to the next slide. So like we've been sharing over email and in, our, in the chat as well, the Summit Handbook is your one-stop shop for everything you need during and after the summit. Um, for time's sake, we won't go through the actual summit, but if you have, or through the actual handbook, but um, if you have any questions as you're checking it out, feel free to let us know. Um, it has the detailed agenda. It also has um, a spreadsheet with everyone's contact information or everyone who um, consented to sharing their contact information. Um, so you can use that to find and connect with folks you meet in your breakout rooms and whatnot. You can also go in and edit your own information um, and add your own information if your information is not there already. Um, and all the other materials and slides from today, including the notes, the recordings, everything will all be sent out uh, later this week. Um, and just a reminder, we will be recording all of today's sessions, except for the optional ones. A few really quick reminders and apologies. I know I'm speeding through these, um, but just saying that there's one Zoom link for the whole day, despite there being multiple calendar invites. Um, we'd love for y'all to keep your cameras on if you um, are available to. And finally, everyone on the SOAR team has orange hearts in front of their names. So we need anything or if you have a question, um, you can always message one of us, specifically me and Megna. Um, and just want to shout out the many folks on the SOAR team who are supporting today. Um, and thank you for bearing with us through that. We're